Okay, thank you a lot for the presentation. So, uh, yeah. Okay, so we all know the, uh, the setting of a single encryption where we have a block cipher which uh, encrypts uh, n bit plain text to n bit cipher text uh, with a key k. And uh, we assume for simplicity that uh, the k is also n, bit, uh, n bits. Uh, long and the associated cryptoanalytic problem is as follows. So we are given a list of plain text ciphertext pairs, P1, C1, P2, C2, etc. And our goal is to find all the keys K such that the encryption uh, of P1 under K equals C1, the encryption of P2 under K uh, equals C2, and so forth. Um, now the trivial algorithm to do this is exhaustive search. So basically, you iterate over all keys, all possible values of k, and for each one, you test whether they uh, satisfy this condition. And this requires time of uh, 2 to the n and a negligible amount of memory. OK, now you may not be satisfied with an n-bit key, and you may want to consider double encryption. And here, what we have is we have uh, two independent keys, k1 and k2, and you encrypt pay, uh, p the plain text P by encrypting it using K1 and you obtain an intermediate encryption value of X, you encrypt it using K2 and you obtain the cipher text. And this was uh, suggested uh, following uh, concerns about the small key sizes of this uh, about uh, 30 or more years ago. And, uh, but uh, following uh, shortly after, afterwards, uh, Merkel and Hellman in 1981 proposed a meet in the middle attack which showed that the security of double encryption is not quite what uh, people thought. So the attack is quite simple. It goes as follows. So for each, uh, basically we iterate over all the possible values of K1. For each one of them, we partially encrypt P1 and store the uh, suggestion for the in uh, intermediate, intermediate encryption value X in the list. Uh, which we sort according to x. And then we basically do the same for the bottom part of the cipher. So we partially, so uh, for each value of k2, we partially decrypt c1 using uh, k2. We match uh, with the uh, sorted list. And then we test uh, the, the full key uh, using the remain, re remaining plain text, uh, plain text cipher text pairs. And this has time of 2 to the n, which is. Uh, Right, which is the same as uh, for single encryption, but requires memory of two to, uh, also a memory of two to the n. So basically, uh, you have the two to the two n, uh, of exhaustive search, and you shift some of the uh, of the time into memory, and uh, you obtain uh, this uh, this trade-off. Okay, so uh, shortly after this attack, then people uh, naturally started looking at triple encryption, and here. Uh, you have three independent keys, K1, K2, and K3, and you encrypt K P using K1, then uh, with K2, then with K3. And in fact, the triple DES was used as the uh, encryption standard for a few years, and it is even, uh, even used today in the banking industry. Um, so what about security? So uh, a trivial extension of the attack, the two-round attack that we just saw, uh, can break it in time 2 to the 2n and memory 2 to the n. This is simply by guessing a, a one round key and applying the two round attack. And this is still the best known attack on uh, triple uh, encryption uh, that is known today. Okay, so what we will do in this talk is consider a, a straightforward uh, generalization of uh, double and triple encryption. We'll consider uh, the general problem of R for encryption. Uh, where we, you encrypt P using uh, K independent keys, K1 to KR. Uh, sorry, using R independent keys, uh, uh, K1 up to KR. Okay, so what about security? So uh, it is very easy to adapt the meet in the middle attack to attack uh, the R fold encryption in time T and memory N such that their product is uh, equal to 2 to the RN which is the number of uh, possible keys that we have in our scheme, and we'll denote it by capital N. Okay, and uh, 
I don't know if you would have asked me a year ago, and I think you would have gotten the same answer for most uh, crypto, for most cryptographers, for most cryptographers, then uh, I, I think. Uh, yeah, I would have told you that this is probably the best that you can do with these types of algorithms. Uh, well, it turns out that it is not because some, uh, some interesting things start happening already with R equals four. So with R equals four, we have uh, an improved attack uh, which requires a memory of two to the n. So the attack is quite simple and it is based on the, uh, on, uh, I mean, it's first uh, in, uh, uh, major step is, is, is to guess uh, the intermediate value of x2, which is defined by uh, the encryption of p1 using k1 and k2. So basically, we have an outer loop that iterates over all these values. And for each one of these values, we do the following. So let's concentrate on the top part here. So given p1 and x2, we can obtain two to the n suggestions for k1 and k2 using the two round attack. Uh, the standard two round meet in the middle attack. Okay, and for each such suggestion, okay, we partially encrypt P2 and obtain a suggestion for Y2, which we sort, which we uh, sort and uh, uh, store in, uh, in the list. According, the, the list is sorted according to Y2. Okay, so this was uh, the top part of the cipher and for the bottom we basically do the same. So um, given X2 and, and, uh, and C1, we obtain two to the end suggestions for K3 and K4 using our two uh, uh, round meet in the middle attack. And then the, the next step is, is to obtain the suggestions uh, for Y2 by partially decrypting C2 and matching with the list. And then we obtain a suggestion for the full key and we test it using, uh, P, uh, using uh, the remaining plaintext uh, ciphertext pairs. And this requires time two to the two n, and why is that? Well, each one of these steps requires two to the n time, and it is repeated two to the, I mean, we repeat these steps two to the n time, so the time is roughly two to the two n, and the memory is about uh, uh, two to the n. Okay, actually we obtain the same parameters with same, say, optimal parameters as we obtained for triple encryption, which is, uh, seems quite surprising because I mean, we added uh, another round key, but actually, in some way, we did not even uh, increase the security. So this is, uh, in some sense, uh, a bit surprising. Okay, so we saw that uh, interesting things start happening already with R equals four. Okay, so we obtained a product of T of N M, which is equal to two to the three N instead of two to the four N, which you would expect by the classical algorithms. So, uh, okay, we ask ourselves, of course, what happens when we increase our further? Um, so we want first uh, at least to, to, uh, to simplify our life by fixing m to be two to the n, and we try to minimize the running time of the algorithm. Okay, and this is the situation that, uh, uh, this is uh, uh, the, what, what we obtain from uh, the classical meet in the middle algorithms. But I just showed you that for r equals four, we can do it in time two to the two n instead of two to the three n. And uh, this carries over to r equals five because you can basically guess one round key and apply the four round attack and you obtain a time complexity of two to the three n and so forth. So for r equals six and for r equals seven, you can do in two to the five n and, and, and so on. But uh, actually this is also not optimal. So. Actually, for r equals seven, you can do better than two to the five n. Now, this is really surprising. Um, I think, uh, in my opinion, this is probably the most uh, surprising result um, because we saw that interesting things happen when r equals two because we get the same time complexity as r equals one. And we saw that you know, an interesting thing happened when r equals four. So I would have guessed that the next you know, magic number is r equals eight, but... <laughs> I don't know, just, uh, you know, I'm a computer scientist, but actually it happens with R equals seven. And uh, yeah, I don't know, it, it just is really striking. Okay, so let's see the attack. The attack is actually very simple. Okay, so what we do is we split the seven round cipher, cipher into a top uh, round with, uh, sorry, into two parts with the, the top part has three rounds and the bottom uh, has four, uh, four rounds. Okay, and we guess two intermediate encryption values in the middle. 
And then obviously we apply our three round attack to the, po to the uh, top portion and we obtain two to the n suggestions for the key. Okay, and uh, we have two to the n memory so we store them all, uh, we can store them all as we usually do. However, for the bottom part we would like to apply a four round attack. But we have only, you can see that we have four n bits of key and we have two n bits of constraint. So uh, the four round attack, if we try to apply it, uh, will return us two to the two n keys and we don't have enough memory to store them. However, the, the main observation here, which is quite simple, is that we don't really need to store them. We can actually apply the four round attack and test the remaining keys, the suggested keys on the fly. Okay, uh, matching it with the upper part. Okay, so this is quite simple, but I think uh, equally surprising. Okay, so for, uh, as the analysis, we have an outer loop, uh, which requires two to, which is iterated two to the two n times, and uh, for each uh, such uh, iteration, the top uh, three round attack requires two to the two n time, the bottom four round attack also two to the two n time, and so the total complexity is two to the four n instead of two to the six n which you obtain by the classical algorithms. Okay, so we obtain a product of t of, of t and m, uh, of t and m which is equal two to the five n instead of two to the seven n. Okay, of course now we would like to see what happens next. Uh, okay, so we saw that our seven round attacks divide the cipher asymmetrically into a top and bottom part. So we saw that this was the situation before I introduced the seven round attack and, and now we know that these numbers, uh, we, can, we have an attack with these numbers on seven and eight round. And it turns out that the, the, the techniques that I just presented can be extended recursively by dividing the cipher asymmetrically into sub ciphers. And what we obtain is some kind of a magic sequence of turning points which we have, uh, which we already know four and seven and we continue by 11, 16, 22 and, and so forth. And the algorithm becomes increasingly more efficient compared to the standard meet in the middle techniques. So for example, for R equals four, we have two to the two n compared to two to the three n. So the difference here is, uh, is n between the exponents. And for R equals seven, the difference is two n. For R equals 11, it is three n and so forth. Okay, and if you do the asymptotic analysis, you can get the uh, asymptotic time complexity of the algorithm is two to the n uh, times r minus uh, a factor of uh, square root of two r, which is about what we gain compared to the standard meet in the middle attacks. Okay, and I don't I have time to show this, but the algorithm basically generalized generalize to any amount of memory. Okay, so you may ask yourself where does the asymmetry come from because most uh, recursive algorithms try to divide the problem in a symmetric way in order to avoid bottlenecks. However, here there is built in asymmetry between the top and the bottom uh, ciphers because in the top part we store all the suggestions in memory and so at most two to the n suggestions must remain. However, in the bottom part we can check the keys on the fly. So in terms of memory, there's actually no restriction on the number. Of course, we will pay in terms of time because we still need to enumerate them, but there is no restriction in terms of memory. So in some sense, it is better to have more rounds in the bottom part. And that is why we obtain such asymmetric uh, 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 divisions of the, the cipher. Okay, so we obtained a new class of algorithms, which we call uh, dissection algorithms. And why is that? Because we have a, a visual picture in mind where we perform a cuts of different sizes in different places in the encryption st structure and apply, this is, looks kind of like a dissection. I don't know <laughs> about you, but uh, yeah. Okay. So, okay, so uh, we saw that our dissection algorithms um, are uh, applicable to uh, R fold encryption. And, uh, but it turns out that they are in, in fact applicable to a more, uh, more general set of problems, which we call uh, composite problems. And composite problem is defined as follows. So we are given an initial value and the final value of, uh, of a cascade of R steps. And in each step, we know that uh, 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 we have a limited set of transformation that 
transformations that can be applied to the value, and our goal is to find out which transformation was applied in each step. And we want to find all the possible solutions, and clearly our, our fold encryption is a composite problem. But it is not the only composite problem, there are many more, and one, one more composite problem, and a quite famous one, which has been studied for many, many years, is the knapsack problem. So the knapsack, the knapsack problem is defined as follows. So we have an, an, a list of n generators, a1 to an, each one of n bits, and a target uh, integer of s. And we would like to find uh, a subset of the generators, which sums to s. And we, uh, we uh, uh, define the vector epsilon as an indicator for the subset, which is uh, epsilon is, of course, a, a and bit boolean uh, vector. Okay, so how can we apply our uh, techniques to, to knapsack? Well, the first step uh, uh, would be to represent it as a block cipher, and how do we do that? It is quite simple. So given an arbitrary uh, n bit plant xp and, uh, and the subset uh, epsilon, which uh, functions as the key, uh, how do we encrypt p? Well, we simply uh, uh, add to it the corresponding generators indicated by the subset, and we obtain some ciphertext C. Okay, and uh, by fixing the plaintext to be zero and the ciphertext to be S, then the knapsack problem reduces to recovering the key of the block cipher, okay, given one plaintext ciphertext pair. Okay, so let's see how we, how we uh, represent the knapsack problem as a multiple encryption. So let's, uh, let's focus on R fold encryption. Of course, there is nothing special about uh, four, but uh, this is just for the sake of, uh, uh, just for the example. So uh, we split the knapsack into four independent knapsacks, which sum up to S, and the situation, I mean, the, the, the image that we have now is, is, is this. We split the generators accordingly, and the intermediate encryption value uh, Xi is defined as the sum of the knapsack up to, up to that point. Okay, so we've split uh, our knapsack into four. However, there is a problem since in R fold encryption, right, we have R small uh, plaintext and it is easy to guess intermediate encryption values, okay, e e efficiently. I mean, we, because the key is, is of much uh, uh, larger size, but here we have one big plaintext and we cannot guess intermediate encryption values because Guessing them is as, uh, cost as much as guessing the key. So what we must do is, is we must split the block cipher also in a vertical way like this. We split it into n divided by four bit blocks. However, this introduces another uh, problem since now there is dependency between the vertical chunks uh, through addition carries. Okay, there are uh, carries propagating we have the block cipher, which causes uh, dependencies between the chunks. And in order to process such a vertical chunk or an encryption, if you want, uh, we, we must know the carries. Uh, but the solution to this is actually quite simple. So uh, when we apply our di dissection algorithms, we simply uh, process the, the blocks in their natural order from uh, right to left. And so when we come to, when we come to process a block, uh, sorry, uh, not a block, but a vertical chunk. Okay, we already know the carries that are required in order to do so. Okay, so the conclusion is basically that we can uh, apply our techniques to the algor uh, knapsack algorithm uh, for any R. I mean, four is not uh, really a special number. Um, okay, and we choose R according to the amount of, of memory that we have in order to optimize the running time of our dissection algorithms. And what we obtain is a time memory curve, which looks like this. Okay, this is our curve. And let's concentrate first on, uh, on these two uh, uh, previous attacks. So this is a classical algorithm of uh, Chopin and Shamir from 81, which corresponds to this point here. And it was extended uh, a year ago by uh, Becker, Korn, and Ju to this dashed line here. And we, uh, using our dissection techniques, are able to uh, improve this uh, this line, and we obtain this line here, and we also extend it all the way to, to zero here. So if you, if you look carefully, you'll see that the, the numbers here 
are exactly the, the magic sequence, the, the numbers of the magic sequence that I saw, that we saw uh, in, the, in the previous slides. So let's, uh, for a second, zoom in on, uh, on M equals uh, uh, one seventh. What, what this basically means that when we have uh, a memory which is equal to capital N to the one seventh, Okay, then we want to divide our, our knapsack problem into seven and apply our seven round encryption that I presented, and we will obtain a time complexity of uh, uh, capital N to the power of four uh, divided by seven, and this is exactly the point here. Okay, and uh, this basically goes, uh, I mean, this is basically the case for all the points, and we, in our paper, show how to uh, connect the points in a straight line. Okay, so we saw that knapsack is one composite problem to which we can apply our techniques, but there are other uh, problems. And one, prob one uh, classical problem is Rubik's Cube. Again, this is very general and classical problems, but there are other problems. Another problem is uh, the matching phase, for example, in rebound attacks, and the more perhaps relevant, uh, 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 yeah, the most relevant problem is card shuffling, and, and of course there are many more. Okay, um, just one uh, last comment before I conclude. So um, until now, we, we, we consider only uh, algorithms. I did not explicitly mention this, but we considered only algorithms that are guaranteed to return all solutions. Um, however, in the second half of the paper, we show to combine our techniques with uh, a probabilistic algorithm of parallel coll collision uh, search and uh, using this uh, combination, which is very involved, and of course I don't have time to present it, uh, we obtain significantly improved attacks where, where the amount of memory is very small. Okay, so a uh, uh, few conclusions. So we improved our best known, the best known algorithms for uh, multiple encryption, and our techniques allow us to, to improve the best known uh, algorithm for uh, the, the famous knapsack problems with a relatively small amount of memory, and there are also, uh, the techniques are also uh, applicable to other composite problems which have nothing uh, to do with the cryptography. Okay, but uh, many open issues remain. I'll just uh, name a few. So uh, are our uh, results optimal? In particular, can you improve our seven round attack? Maybe you can. Uh, Another open problem is to prove lower bounds for composite problems. In particular, we don't know how to uh, prove the, uh, what seems to be trivial that the time is equal to the square root of uh, capital N. We don't even know how to prove that. Uh, another interesting open problem is, well, our, our algorithm uses the, uh, the smallest number of plain text cipher text pairs that are required in order to, to recover the key but can you improve the attacks using maybe a bit more data? And of course, we want to uh, find additional applications for our uh, dissection algorithms. Okay, and that would be all. Thank you all for listening.